We're still about three weeks away from Michigan State, Alabama. Should be a great one at the Cotton Bowl. And people are expecting a knuckle-bleeding, uh, toe-to-toe matchup with uh, the Spartans and the Tide getting after it. Uh, we bring in uh, Stephen M. Smith from Touchdown Alabama, who's just a great source for Alabama and the SEC. Stephen, how are you? Doing very well. Um, waited till the last minute to start my Christmas shopping, but uh, it's a great thing I have attention to detail. Isn't that the way, though? You know, it's Christmas pretty much jumps up on me as well. So uh, I'm still right there with you uh, on that front. So we've got some news and notes to take care of. So it's so a little house cleaning. Jeremy Pruitt coming back to Bama as defensive coordinator. He's gone to some other high-profile spots in recent years at Florida State and Georgia. Just your thoughts about retaining Pruitt. I thought it was a big, big move. I, I kind of think of it as a long exchange. If you th- if you look back from 2007 to 2009, as Saban was really building this Alabama program, Pruitt and Smart, Kirby Smart, were both with Saban at the same time. Kirby Smart was more so the administrative assistant then goes to defensive back coach and defensive coordinator. Jeremy Pruitt at that time was a director of player personnel, developing that personnel in Alabama. So both were there at the same time, though Alabama losing Kirby Smart to Georgia, Saban bringing back another familiar face in Jeremy Pruitt. So it was a long exchange, in my opinion. Uh, Pruitt was Rivals.com's National Recruiter of the Year in 2012. Uh, Pruitt has worked with a lot of the Alabama players that are now in the National Football League. Demarcus Milner, Vinny Sinceri, Mark Barron, Drake Kirkpatrick, just key names off the top of my head, Kareem Jackson, Javier Arenas, a lot of these players that are now at the next level. Pruitt had uh, hands-on experience with those guys. And then you look at Derrick Henry, Jacob Coker, TJ Yeldon, Reggie Ragland, Pruitt recruited all of these young, all of those young men to the University of Alabama. So he's very much familiar with the process and how Saban operates. It was a very good exchange, in my opinion, bringing back Jeremy Pruitt and filling in the role left behind by Kirby Smart. Stephen, you mentioned uh, before we came on the air that uh, Scott Cochran uh, retained as a strength and conditioning coach. He also had some interesting recruiting news uh, that seems to be coming to a head uh, later today. Going into Scott Cochran, it was big news. Uh, Alabama gets his own version of Coach Boom, not Will Muschamp, but their (laughs) own Coach Boom back. And Scott Cochran, a guy that's very much so enthusiastic, very energetic, and he's a lot of these players don't see their position coach every day. They see Scott Cochran every day. He's the first He's the first face these guys see when they enter the player's facility to work out. He's the first face these guys see when they go to practice. He's the guy that's screaming, not just the yeah, 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 screaming, but he's the guy that's leading them in the workout, leading them in the warm-up, getting the mindset right early on not just in practice, but in workout sessions and game-like situations, Scott Cochran's that guy. He's the secret weapon in terms of the diet regimen, getting that physical build on all of these players, and just really bonding with these guys on and off the field. He's been with Saban since his days at LSU, his days with the Miami Dolphins, and now in Alabama. Uh, Scott Cochran joining the likes of Bobby Williams, special teams coach, and uh, Burton Burns, running backs coach, as the three longest, longest tenured assistants with Saban. Those three, Williams, Cochran, and Burns, have all been with Saban since 2007. So it was very, very nice for the Crimson Tide fans to know that Scott Cochran will remain in Alabama as strength coach for next season. The recruiting news happens to be Dakota Prucock, the six foot two, 200 pound quarterback from Montana State, FCS region. Uh, Prucock has thrown for 3,025 passing yards, 28 touchdowns, and 10 interceptions this season. He's got a rocket arm, as I've seen on tape, but uh, his two schools that he wants to transfer to, it comes down between Oregon 
in Alabama tonight at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time as he makes that decision. It's kind of awkward to see this happening because Alabama actually has five quarterbacks on the roster, Alec Morris, David Cornwell, Cooper Bateman, Blake Barnett, and then, of course, Jalen Hurts, the four-star recruit from the Texas area, if he signs on on National Signing Day. So that's five guys. They also have a couple of walk-ons, Seth Franks and you know another guy that's a walk-on. So getting another quarterback, I understand death is one of Saban's MOs, but I, I just don't see Lane Kiffin going out there hand-picking a five-star in Blake Barnett from San Diego High School, Corona, California, and not starting him next year because the players love him. Gino Matias Smith, defensive back, who who graduated this past weekend, had so much praise for Blake Barnett, calling him very capable player. He's learned the playbook. He's put on some weight. He's done well, you know, as a scout team quarterback. But Dakota Prucock will make his decision today as to whether he'll go to either Oregon or the University of Alabama. Good stuff there, Stephen. We'll be looking out for that and seeing what happens. And as you mentioned, Cornwell and Barnett very well uh, regarded, and Barnett uh, in particular. So it's interesting to see uh, what they're doing on the quarterback front in regards to just incredible, incredible depth. I mean, it, it's, it's like you're walking into a candy store, Mark. Do I choose the Starburst or the Skittles, or do I get a nice Twix bar? It's, it's, it's incredible how much Alabama is trying to stockpile these quarterbacks. You go with the Twix bar. I always go with the chocolate when it comes to desserts, Stephen M. That's, that's me. It's always chocolate. Got to be chocolate. All right, we got two weeks to talk Alabama and Michigan State, so hopefully we can uh, track you down one more time to break down this matchup when we get a little bit closer to it. But uh, we'll, we'll just uh, give it a broad brush uh, stroke right now. And, and when we look at what Vegas thinks of this game, they've considered Alabama like a nine-point favorite, and it's jumped up a bit, I believe, best based on the the, the – the public perception and betting on the Alabama side. And, and that really comes down to uh, Vegas all season is considered Alabama and Ohio state to be the best teams. And they would be the favorites against anyone and be a pretty much an even game based on Vegas. Vegas doesn't know everything. They got to play the games on the field and Oklahoma would be the next team in the mix that Alabama would not be a huge favorite against. So it comes down to Michigan state doesn't have quite those layers of four and five stars. Plus, I don't know if this is really a good matchup in regards to Connor Cook, very capable quarterback, excellent quarterback, but he's going to stay in the pocket. And Michigan State doesn't have that wrecking ball of a, of a ground game like they've had in the past. LJ Scott's very capable, and he's a comer as a freshman, but the ground game hasn't been what it's been in the past. It's been Cook from the pocket that's won games for this team. I think in this one, Mark, it's going to come down to both offensive coordinators, Lane Kiffin of Michigan of uh, Alabama, and also with Michigan State. It's going to have to be receivers have to create separation. You talk about Connor Cook, very exceptional player. I love his ability to look off the safety, target guys downfield, put balls in accurate spots. But that receiving core of Michigan State, it's got to create separation away from Cyrus Jones, away from Marlon Humphrey, away from Minka Fitzpatrick. They got to be able to get open in the middle of the field, run those timing routes, those comeback routes, those out routes, find ways to get Connor Cook able to find them in the open field and make big-time plays. Alabama's secondary hasn't given up quite as many big plays as it's had in recent years. The Crimson Tide plus seven in the turnover battle. But Michigan State has got to create separation in that wide-out receiving core and allow Connor Cook the opportunity to find those guys downfield. Also, I feel like it comes down to which offensive coordinator opens up that playbook and gives that quarterback an opportunity. Hey, I'm going to give you reins to target these guys. We're going to we're going to keep we're going to try to keep the opposing defense honest. Mix mix and match. Whichever coach and coordinator does not try to play this game so close to the vest, I think we'll win this competition. I go back to Alabama's 2011 
regular season game against LSU. Both teams played it so close to the best, running the football with Trent Richardson, running the football with Jeremy Hill, you know, special teams kicking the ball, taking the points when they're there. They played it very much so close to the best. And the rematch between Alabama and LSU, you saw offensive coordinator Jim McElwain look to A.J. McCarron, despite him being a first-year starter, and open up the pass game, the dink and dunk patterns, the five-yard gains, the 10-yard gains, open it up for A.J. McCarron. And then in time, you saw Trent Richardson get it going late. It's going to come down to keeping the opposing defense off balance, mix and match who can open up the pass game first. Yeah, uh, it's a very different Michigan State team than what we've seen in the past. Again, the run, not so prevalent against the likes of the better teams. They didn't slam the ball straight ahead and gain much yardage against Iowa, Michigan, Ohio State. They won going to the air and didn't even have Connor Cook against Ohio State. The defense completely won that game. The thing that's going to give Sparty a chance here, Stephen, I think is Early in the season, it was all Connor Cook in the passing game that won these games. They were winning shootouts against inferior teams, uh, Air Force, Central Michigan, the likes of those teams. They were giving up a lot on defense, but the defense has just improved incredibly late in the season, and they really took it to Ohio State and Iowa. So that Michigan State defense needs to show up for them to have any chance against Alabama. One step, Mark, Michigan State, plus 14 in the turnover battle. They attack the football. They follow the flow of the football. And just like Connor Cook, the same with Lane Kiffin. Get Jacob Coker in attack mode. Find ways for him to get those passes to Calvin Ridley and our Darius Stewart. But the one thing for Jacob Coker, it cannot be ill-advised throws. You cannot have him throwing in double, triple, quadruple coverage versus a calculated risk where you may have Calvin Ridley one-on-one. -on -one. You may have Ardarius Stewart, who is finally starting to learn how to be that game-breaking receiver, him in a one-on-one -on -one situation. I think Kiffin would rather take Coker putting the ball in the air in a one-on-one -on -one matchup than having an ill-advised throw in double, triple, or just too much coverage. So it comes down for Alabama finding ways for Jacob Coker to be successful passing the football. And also, when he sees a run lane, don't be afraid to take it. I go back to Georgia, Texas A&M, and Florida in the SEC title game. When Coker saw the run lanes available, he wasn't afraid to pull the ball down, try the zone read, pick up some yards. Now, he does need to learn to slide and protect that six foot six frame. But Coker's a tough kid. He doesn't mind taking the pops. He doesn't mind taking the licks. But in the same manner of Michigan State for Alabama and Lane Kiffin, find ways for Jacob Coker to attack the secondary. Because Michigan State, they've got some ball hogs. They're not plus 14 and that turnover margin for nothing. And Jacob Coker's not going to make anybody forget Michael Vick, but I tell you, he'll put his foot in the ground and make some guys miss. He's got a little wiggle in the open field. It's I know what, his, his players, his players, his teammates refer to him, Mark, as two words: Vanilla Vick and Baby Roethlisberger. <laughs> Oh, I love that. That's good stuff right there. Yeah, it's a, it's a combo of the two. There's no question about it. When you look at him versus then you see him in the open field. And and again, it, it's not looking real pretty. And it's not happening real fast. But still, he's making SEC linebackers and DBs miss in the open field. It, it's kind of funny to watch. He, Stephen M. will bring you on, hopefully. He's got deceptive footwork. <laughs> Yes, he does. Stephen M., we can hopefully track you down in the next couple of weeks and really break down uh, the X's and O's, and hopefully nothing happens on the injury or suspension front in the meantime. And I'll, I'll have you keep one thing in mind for the next time we bring you on. You give us an over-under figure on the carries that Derrick Henry, after 47 and 44 the last two games, will have against Michigan State. So you, you think about that one. I got you. <laughs> All right, Stephen M. Smith from Touchdown Alabama helping us break down the Tide and the Spartans, and hopefully we'll have him back here in the next few weeks uh, before the big New Year's Eve clash. Stephen, you have a nice day. Thanks for coming on, man. No problem, Mark. Thank you.